Um, my name is Sheila Whitley. I work with the Overseas Development Institute based here in London. Um, I'm very excited about this panel. Uh, it's a topic um, I don't think gets enough kind of discussion and recognition, um, both in the kind of discussions on supply side policy, um, but also some even in the broad, broader climate discussions. Um, and we have a really, really exciting um, group of speakers today. So I'm not going to take up too much time at the beginning, I guess just to quickly outline what the panel is about. Uh, so we're looking at this question of the role of national oil companies in this transition away from oil and gas production. And I guess the combination of the role of the company, but also the role of the government, you know, who has chosen to set up this company, how, did, how what's the interaction also between the state and these state-owned enterprises. Uh, the panel and this conversation is about oil and gas, but Really, this is also equally important for coal and also really important for fossil fuel fired power production. If you look across all areas of oil and gas production, um, uh, coal production and fossil fuel power, depending on estimates, you see that between 70 to 80 percent of that is state owned globally, state owned and controlled. And recent um, information from the IEA World Energy Investment Outlook, some of you may, you may have followed that, the biggest statistic that came out of that report was the fall in investment in renewable energy. But the second message from that report, which I'm hoping the IEA will do more about and maybe we can work on that with them, is that actually state ownership in energy investment is increasing. So between 2012 and 2017, it increased um, for oil and gas production and also for thermal power. So the role of the state in, in this space is only growing. So it's, only, it's important and it's only getting more important. Um, so I'm going to now uh, hand over to our panelists, um, and that's going to be starting with uh, David Manley from the Natural Resource Governance Initiative, um, who again is going to kind of give some framing for the, the question and some initial research that they've been doing on the topic. Um, Valerie Marcel is going to look from Chatham House is going to be talking a little bit more about the different different models and strategies that um, national oil companies might be taking in the transition. Um, Dominic Martin is here from Equinor, um, which is the Norwegian state-owned oil and gas company, uh, formerly Stat Oil, and so is going to speak to the kind of the thoughts and strategies from Equinor's perspective. And then we're very fortunate to have Paul Mullet here um, from the King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center, um, which is based in Saudi Arabia, who will speak a bit to the case of the NOCs in the Gulf and also some of the kind of bigger existential questions to hopefully kick off our discussion. Uh, each presenter is going to speak for about 10 minutes, and then um, we really hope to have a kind of lively conversation um, afterwards. Um, so with that, David, great if you can start us off. Uh, we work in resource-rich but otherwise poor countries, countries like Ghana and Tanzania, uh, Colombia, Mexico, Indonesia, Myanmar, and, and a few others. And we work both from the research level, working in places like London and New York, connecting with researchers like you guys, and using that to underpin our work in countries, working <laughs> with uh, government ministries, uh, policy organizations outside government, and, and sometimes state companies, uh, both to advise, to support, and, and to train, and for, to advocate. Um, we've just started, really, on this um, this space of, of climate change and, and the energy transition and thinking about what, what this poses as a, as a risk to the economic models of the countries we work in. And we initially looked very broadly, uh, looked at what's, what's, uh, what assets might be stranded, what's the kind of policy implications, but we quite quickly focused on national oil companies as, as the key institution, the key organisation that, that we think... Uh, is in most need of, of focus of, of our sort of uh, advice. Um, so national oil companies are important uh, because they are often the, the representative of the state in, in, in many oil projects in their country. They're responsible for either generating or handling very large amounts of, of cash uh, coming from the oil projects and, and, and delivering it to, the, to their governments but sometimes also retaining these revenues. Um, they don't necessarily have a lot of transparency and oversight, so they can be taking a lot of decisions themselves um, without uh, the oversight of, of the government shareholders or without the oversight of, of institutional investors and, and private sector investors on the stock exchange. 
And um, it varies, but in cases, say, in, in Equinor, they're, they're, they're listed and uh, information is, is uh, fairly accurate. Uh, um, but in other NOCs, it can be quite poor um, and in some cases non-existent. So what we have tried to do is at least take what information is out there, um, published usually by the NOCs themselves, or in some cases, reports from uh, initiatives like the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, and put it in, all into one database. And this database will be coming out hopefully early next year. It's covering uh, about 74 national oil companies and 80 more data variables uh, covering uh, the, the main items that you would see in a balance sheet and income statement, and then some variables around uh, production, uh, uh, employment, and, and more operational measures. Um, but obviously, it misses out some very important NOCs, uh, like Saudi Aramco, that, that, that don't publicly report anything, even if they do report uh, uh, to, to their government shareholder. So what can we say with this, this data? Well, there's some obvious things. Um, uh, these NOCs handle a lot of the cash in, uh, in governments. So what we've done here is take the total transfers of, of companies uh, against the total government revenues collected in the country across the whole economy. So in some cases, uh, a very large amount, um, 80% uh, from Qatar Petroleum, for example, um, Sun and Gull, 35% uh, or so, and, and going down. Um, so large amounts of revenue all concentrated in one single institution. Um, but this revenue is also volatile. So we, we picked, and it's, it's come off the slide here, unfortunately. Um, the green was revenues in 2014. The orange was re revenues in 2015 when prices dropped. And so you can see in some cases very large uh, 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 volatility changes in, in revenue. Um, so we started looking at what does this mean, like which, which NOCs could be most exposed to a general decline in prices for, from something like the, the energy transition. Um, we're, we're looking at um, how these NOCs behaved in, in the last price crash. Um, the other thing we've been looking at is um, uh, what is, I think has become quite common in, in the last two days, looking at the, the cost curve of each NOC, taking uh, the, the interests and all the assets the NOCs have um, and, and forming a cost curve. So this looks at um, the blue is Pertamina's um, assets in Indonesia. Pertamina is the NOC of Indonesia. And the green here is NNPC, the, the Nigerian NOC. Um, and so what we did, a very common, I think, carbon track and fuel institutions are doing the same, is look what happens uh, if prices drop, uh, how, how does that impact uh, um, uh, the profits of these NOCs and how does it impact the amount of money being transferred to their governments? Um, and we can rank all this. Uh, so, and this is all using Reistad's UQ database mainly. Um, with countries like, like Saudi Aramco uh, and other uh, Middle Eastern NOCs, their, uh, their revenues um, don't fall uh, so much compared to, to uh, companies down here like Gazprom, uh, Kazman and Gas, the Kazakhstan NOC, and the Mozambique NOC, much more exposed to a fall in, in prices. Now, it depends. Um, what prices um, we look at because the cost curves change um, 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 both over time but also at different uh, price levels. But this starts to show that um, some companies are much more exposed than others. Um, except that even, even countries at the top here, um, they may be less exposed financially, um, but they also have quite high uh, social break-even uh, prices. So even small uh, drops in revenue uh, mean uh, a significant impact on, on the extent that governments can actually support uh, their social welfare programs and, and spending in the economy. Um, so there's, there's two sides to this exposure, both um, the actual finances of the company, but also the exposure of the government. Um, we also looked on the, the asset side. Uh, so this is looking at 
the NOC equity divided by the total gross government debt of, of each of their companies. Um, just to give a perspective of, of what, what this looks like. Um, and in many cases, this, this is pretty large. Um, um, these are absolutely large numbers, very huge numbers. Um, the reason for that is we're, we're using gross government debt rather than, than other measures. But, but hopefully it gives a ballpark figure that um, this, these NOCs represent um, a big opportunity um, for these, these countries to divest and, and divest some of this equity and pay down debt or to diversify into other assets. Um, but it's also showing an opportunity cost that mostly this, this value is coming from NOCs retaining revenues. Um, so it's, it's either a, um, a actual policy of the government to, to grow their NOCs or it's um, uh, the NOC is doing this without the oversight of, of the government. We also looked at the same thing, but for NOC debt to, to government debt. Um, so this tells a kind of reverse story that if the, these NOCs become uh, big financial liabilities for their, for their governments, um, it could be, and we want to look into this more, some of these NOCs could be too big to fail. Uh, they, uh, if prices fall o over a period of time, um, it could be that these governments have to um, start supporting uh, these, these NOCs and taking on some of their debt. And if that's the case, uh, it can re represent a very large amount of, of added debt on top of what the government's already holding. Um, so where is this going? Well, well, we'll finish this in the next few, few months, and then we're going to go on the road to uh, the, the ministries and the state companies we'll work in around the world and look at what strategies they will be employing um, and how they can think more critically and analytically, perhaps using some of our databases and, and, and other means, uh, to think about this, this long-term risk and how they might be able to change. Um, so uh, the rest of the panel is going to talk a lot more about these, uh, but we, we can, we're probably dividing their strategies into three sorts of strategies, a, a divest strategy, uh, somehow divesting uh, using IPOs to, to, to shift, to sell some of the equity to, to investors, um, a growth strategy, um, actually buying up more of these assets, particularly low cost assets, um, because no one knows um, when a price decline may happen. There may be two or three more of these price cycles, and, and these companies want to be in on this action. Um, or a change in the role strategy, whether this is working more downstream in refining and petrochemicals, or shifting all over to uh, renewables and other energy sources. And so I think that's a good segue into to Valerie's uh, presentation. I think maybe just to introduce a little bit uh, my background so that you can understand a bit better um, where I'm coming from with my comments. I work for Chatham House. I, I'm a researcher and I've been working on national oil companies for many years now. Um, and I'm very interested in understanding uh, the drivers for their strategies and the constraints that they have. Um, I'm also um, involved in a group called the New Producers Group, which is a knowledge sharing initiative bringing together emerging oil and gas producers. Uh, so it's really like a peer-to-peer south-south -peer network. And I think that might be relevant for our discussion today just in terms of thinking about NOCs that are emerging NOCs that don't yet have the lock-in and have options to consider versus the established NOCs, the historical ones that do have a, a higher degree of, of you know, being on the rails in, in a certain direction. Um, I think, um, so my comments, I'm gonna maybe just mix up a bit the established and, and emerging producers, but maybe in discussion, we can sort of tease that out a bit better. So what I was proposing to talk a bit about today was really thinking of those those strategies that you had. I haven't really tackled divestment, but um, looking at more, would NOCs be the champions for uh, uh, clean energy production or clean, you know, having a clean energy um, uh, towards energy transition? So 
in order to answer that question, I think we'd have to first think, um, would they do that? Would that be a natural strategy for NOCs uh, to, to become you know, clean energy producers? And then we have to ask, could they do it? Would they be efficient uh, entities for engaging in, in that? And I think we, in my remarks, you'll see I'm, there's two likely sort of options. One is an NOC that becomes, that focuses on cleaning up the process of energy production, of oil production and transmission, and that focuses on energy efficiency versus a much deeper transformation, which is to invest in and produce uh, alternative energy. So uh, be it you know, renewable energy, geothermal, or, or something in a, in a new direction. So to go into this question of would they, you know, would it be natural for an NOC to become a national energy company, an NEC? They have, like IOCs, they have uh, business commercial interests and drivers, but they also have to respond to a host of public policy uh, priorities. And I did an exercise with uh, E3G was it like a year and a half ago where they were doing a sort of a games, a sort of a, a role, role playing game to look at how companies would respond to the energy transition. So I'll use a bit of those, that sort of matrix that I prepared then uh, to think about what would be the drivers of the transition. So you think, for example, an NOC that is really operating domestically is going to be very different from an NOC uh, like Equinor or um, uh, Petronas that are very international. The domestic NOC is going to have a much greater concern for the country's energy mix naturally than an international one, which will be behaving like an international oil company. If the NOC is in a diversified or, the, or dependent economy, uh, uh, dependent on oil, I mean, that also has an impact. So in a diversified uh, economy, NOCs are going to have a lot less pressure to be concerned with the energy misks or the growing or nature of the domestic energy demand. Um, also looking at what kind of NOC it is. Is it a proactive NOC or an instrument of the state? A proactive NOC is going to be taking, sort of looking long term, anticipating the transition, thinking about how to respond to it, <clears throat> and think about how climate uh, and uh, climate policies are likely to affect their business. An, an NOC that's an instrument of the state is going to be waiting for government instructions for a change of its mandate or it's a change of its portfolio. <laughs> and then there's the low-cost, easy oil or easy gas NOC, the ones with the really easy, easy to produce reserves versus the ones that are in a more frontier context. So the low cost, easy oil and gas NOCs, well, they're just going to, um, to stay focused on getting that out of the ground, what, regardless of really the price fluctuations for the commodity. Whereas one on the frontier side, so those emerging NOCs I was talking about, well, they can think um, much more um, about whether they develop the reserves. They can think about whether they diversify, they, they transform into another entity because they're at the beginning of that, of that journey. Then if you think about, um, some NOCs are really focused on domestic demand for energy. Uh, so for example, there's, if they have like the, like in Saudi Arabia, very growing demand uh, for energy for electricity that's often generated uh, by oil, they'll, be, they'll have a natural built-in interest to producing alternative sources of energy to meet that need to free up more oil for export, which is you know, bringing in the big revenues. And then also, if um, I think thinking a bit about the electricity market. If it's a regulated electricity market with subsidized electricity, NOCs will have less incentives to invest in that kind of uh, sector. So that gives a bit of an idea of you know, the, the wood day, 
many of them would. They, could, they, they, they might have built-in incentives as companies to go into uh, investing in renewables or, um, or really going in very heavily down the uh, energy efficiency route. So I think, frankly, in all instances, an NOC would be justified and there would be value for the country, for the government, with the NOC investing much more in energy efficiency and in cleaning up the process for extracting and refining and transporting oil. Um, there's not really much to debate there. But in terms of whether they should be investing in renewables, then I think the question is, should, should they do it? Um, and I think, you know, there's an, an assumption that they could transfer the skills and processes they've, ha they've acquired through the oil, upstream oil and gas to renewables. But I think that's really uh, something that would need to be demonstrated. Uh, and I think some further research would be really valuable in that area. Um, because it's really a question for governments of thinking whether these entities would be the best place to, to really carry, carry the transition, the energy transition. So I think governments would have to ask, first, does the NOC have a track record of delivering complex projects on time? Um, does it have good project management capabilities? Second, um, is there a better track record? Is it a better track record than the existing utilities that are in the country? Would the country benefit from having the NEC and the utilities compete? Um, and then is there a vibrant indigenous private sector already in the country that might be taking up these opportunities as you know, renewables for electricity generation becomes more attractive as an investment? Um, and then I think the, um, finally it would, you know, conversely governments could be thinking, well, if we do want to have, to go really, to, to, to participate, to sort of anticipate this energy transition uh, and diversify our portfolio, our energy mix, et cetera, um, it might be good to have the NOC be focused on more than oil because then the NOC has a bit more of a, of a self-interest in not just developing oil, but also thinking about renewables. So some, some avenues uh, for, our, for our reflection and maybe some future research, I hope. Thank you. My name is Dominic Martin. I work for Equinor, which is a Norwegian company. Um, used to be called Statoil until May. So if you've known us as Statoil, you can still get away with using that name for the next few months before I start finding you. Um, what do I do in Equinor? So I'm responsible for government and regulatory affairs on the mid and downstream part of the business. If you like, I think about the regulation of the demand side for our products, uh, particularly in Europe, which is where the majority of, of our gas goes to. And what I think I'm going to do today is three things. First of all, tell you a little bit about Equinor itself and how it's approaching the carbon transition. And secondly, just very briefly spend some time on a particular case study which is the case study of gas in Europe and how we are responding to the challenge of deep decarbonization of that sector. And then thirdly, I will try and answer the exam question. Uh, do we have a comparative advantage because of our, uh, of our NOC nature? Though I would say, I don't think we're a typical NOC for the reasons that David said, we are quoted um, on, the Nor on the Oslo Stock Exchange and the New York Stock Exchange uh, and for the reason that Valerie said, um, we are increasingly not an NOC. We are a bit of a prototype of what you were calling an NEC, I think, um, a national energy company, because we, we are increasingly in the electricity business. We have a big portfolio of wind farms currently in uh, Northwest Europe, but we have licenses in the United States and we have ambitions beyond that too. So, um, some very brief facts for, for those of you who don't know Equinor. Um, when we were called Statoil, we used to describe ourselves as a technology-driven upstream oil and gas company. And there's, with the change of name, there's been a quite explicit transitioning to the way we talk about ourselves. We now talk about ourselves, as I say, as a broad-based energy company with a significant and growing uh, low-carbon business.
And here are some key figures about us. As I said, 66% of uh, our uh, shareholding is, is held by the Norwegian state, allowing 33% to be quoted on, in Oslo and New York. And with that public listing uh, requirement goes all those reporting obligations that were discussed in the session uh, yesterday afternoon. So we, we report and disclose uh, at least as much as any other oil and gas company in the world. And I, I would argue actually probably a bit more. Um, uh, we, we have a sustainability report. We have um, uh, financial statements, which are all public. We publish a, an annual uh, uh, energy perspectives publication which is our look into the, into the future. It's not a forecast, it's a, it's a scenario-based <coughs> exercise. And we have a, I think we were one of the first, if not the first uh, oil and gas company to do an explicit two degree scenario. Uh, we, have, we were the first uh, oil and gas company to publish a, a comprehensive project by project um, uh, report on our payments to governments around the world where we, where we work. And we publish a climate roadmap, which, um, which you can find on, on, on the web. And we, like some of the other companies that were discussed, yes, signed up to the, the A2A resolution. Therefore, we publish every year an estimate of, our, of, the, of, of the resilience of our portfolio under different scenarios, including a two-degree scenario. And for those of you who are interested, the latest stress test on our portfolio suggests that in a two-degree scenario, we, 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 ant we would anticipate a 13% reduction in our overall MPV of our net present value of our our portfolio against business as usual um, in a two degree scenario, which is not insignificant, but it's not um, the end of the world either. Um, here's a little map showing where we are around the world. It's slightly misleading because if you just look at the, the key, it would look like we're, we're everywhere. In fact, we are very much focused on the Atlantic Basin um, uh, and Northwest Europe. We have a big presence in OECD countries. We have a growing presence in Brazil, actually. But um, this emphasis sort of on, on, on the sort of Atlantic Basin and, and the OECD means that I probably, compared with my peers in other oil and gas companies, spend more time thinking about policy risk, regulatory risk, political risk in OECD countries than, than my counterparts in other companies who might be thinking more about uh, other parts of the world. Fortunately, there is no shortage of policy, political, and regulatory risk in OECD countries at the moment for reasons we all know about. Um, this is our vision, and that's not, I'm not putting up there just as a bit of a glossy um, PR slide with some nice photos, but I just wanted to bring out that third bullet and that is describing our vision as a company. Um, and I think uh, if you spend some time with Equinor, you quickly appreciate that the low carbon transition and all that entails is at the heart of our thinking about our future as a company and our business model and our strategy going forward. Uh, our strategy is again, uh, predicated on the idea that a company like ours, which is explicitly moving into the low carbon sector, can derive competitive advantage over our peers by doing that. Uh, sustainability, uh, respect for the environment, we put at the heart of our strategy. Um, we, we have accepted and do accept and will accept all the scientific consensus around the IPCC uh, studies on climate change, uh, unequivocally, we, we don't dissent in any way from it at all. And we, um, we, uh, we recognize our absolute obligation to, 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 to help the, achieve the two degree scenario. Um, uh, in other words, we don't plan for policy failure on the part of the governments of the world. And we, 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 we assume that governments will deliver on what they have committed themselves to do. And that means that our future portfolio uh, needs to be at the same time both high value in terms of its content, but also with the lowest possible carbon footprint. Um, we do have a fundamental belief in the company that low carbon uh, 
creates opportunities for companies that are agile enough. Um, and so we're not just in renewables. Um, we have a very big offshore wind portfolio, as I said. We're also in solar and moving into geothermal. But we're also very active on carbon capture and storage. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. Um, and indeed, if you, even on our traditional oil and gas activities, we believe that there should be competitive advantage by being able to produce our molecules and our, uh, our liquids in, 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 with the least uh, emissions uh, attached to the production of those uh, commodities. Um, some facts and figures about uh, uh, climate change. Um, carbon intensity of our upstream portfolio, that's the, in, the emissions associated with the production of our, our, of our commodities. That's about half the industry average, which is uh, around 18. Um, you'll see that on carbon capture and storage, as I mentioned, um, we are very active already in, in CCS. Uh, this is pre-combustion CCS. Um, 1.36 million tons sequestered in 2017. And in the 20 years that we've been doing this, about 22.3 million tons so far. And we, we, we are very firmly of the belief um, that rapid movement towards widespread deployment of CCS technology is absolutely essential for, for the low carbon transition. We apply an internal carbon price of, of a minimum of $50 to all our projects, wherever they are in the world. But of course, our projects in our home basin, which is the, North, the Norwegian continental shelf, they face an, already face a Norwegian carbon tax of $63 um, on top of the prevailing European ETS price. And that, of course, that high carbon price is what is driving the low carbon intensity of our, of our products. That's carbon uh, uh, taxes actually working to, to, to change behavior. Um, so that's it in summary. We want to be the most carbon efficient oil and gas producer. We want new energy solutions to be a new leg for profitable growth, and we want a robust and competitive renewable portfolio. I said I mentioned gas very briefly. I'm going to have to get gallop through this, I'm afraid. But gas is the, Europe is the biggest market for one of our commodities. Gas comes in pipes from Norway into Europe. The future for this commodity is absolutely crucial to our, to our future as a company. And the challenge is enormous. Gas has been growing in Europe. Gas consumption has been growing in Europe uh, almost unbroken since the 60s. There was a little blip after the financial crisis there. But um, it's growing again now. And that's partly driven, of course, by a coal to gas switch in some companies, countries. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, this uh, recent growth in gas, if it's displacing coal. Um, this, is the, this is the scale of the challenge. Uh, Natural gas provides Norway with about 1,500 terawatts hours of flexible energy. That is the equivalent of 20 billion Tesla batteries, 11, uh, 11 and a half billion um, uh, versions of the big Tesla park in Australia, and 200 times what Norway, which is entirely based on hydro, produces uh, from its hydro resources. This is how we think of the transition. So. Um, the first phase is gas displacing more carbon intensive fuels. And that's the phase that we're in now. And, and it's achieving quite striking results in countries like the UK. Um, then, then the next phase will be gas working with renewables um, to put in sensible combination to achieve the next level of reduction. But if you're going to get to basically total decarbonization of the energy sector by 2050, you're going to have to have done, you're going to have to have decarbonized the gas. And we believe you do that by, by, um, by using CCS and turning the methane into hydrogen and then building a hydrogen economy. And we are very active in working out how this is going to work. We're developing a hydrogen-based CCGT plant in the Netherlands. We're working in the UK on the decarbonization of the heating sector in the north of England. And we're working with marine transport cruise operators in, in, in Norway to, uh, on, on the marine leg of this. Um, so this is, this is, this is, um, this is where we th see the future for, this is how we're thinking about the future of one of our key commodities in one of our key markets. I and mean, it clearly will require a collaboration with government and other stakeholders. 
that you've got to get the policy framework right to incentivize the sort of investments that this will require. Very quickly, the answer to the exam question, uh, comparative advantage, I think probably yes. First of all, I think a company like Equinor can probably afford to take a longer term perspective than some of our peers. We're not perhaps quite as vulnerable to the, the pressures of the, of the investors who are requiring an immediate dividend on their, their, um, on their investments. Um, it clearly helps that we're aligned with the interests of our major investor, which is a Norwegian state. And uh, to, to pick up a theme of yesterday, to, that alignment is vital for, for ensuring that we have the continued license to operate with the Norwegian people who are, 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 are obviously our, our key stakeholder. You might think we would be punished by the markets for, for doing this um, and not... Uh, 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 and not um, and, and not focusing on the sort of the, the you know the, the the established business, that is not happening. Um, Equinor's uh, share price is actually, to, if anything, outperforming it, the peers over in recent times, and maybe that suggests to me that perhaps markets are perhaps uh, rewarding companies who are, who are prepared to to make these rather challenging strategic uh, shifts. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dominic. And I know you had to race through bits of it, but I hope some of the questions from the audience will allow you to kind of elaborate more on, on, on bits and pieces of the strategy. Um, so now, handing over to Paul. Uh, hi, good afternoon. I'm Paul Mollett. I'm from Capsark in Saudi Arabia. For those of us, for those of you who haven't come across us, um, we're an independent think tank in Riyadh. Uh, we're funded by, uh, with a rather large endowment. We have close links uh, with the government, but uh, we are independent and we propose our own, our own research agenda. Uh, in all, we have 70 full-time researchers. Um, about uh, half of them are Saudis, and of those Saudis, probably 60, 70% are women. Um, the sort of themes that we um, we research into are the future of oil in the energy transition, uh, climate change policies and governance, a uh, future of transportation and fuel demand, and energy sector transitions. So as I said, we, we propose our own agenda under the guidance of an international advisory board, and we've got all sorts of luminaries on the board, including people like uh, Richard Newell, or Sunita Narayan, that you probably have heard of. Uh, obviously, understanding how NOCs can navigate the energy transition is a key element of our work. Uh, in fact, for the last uh, two years, we've teamed up with the Klingendale um, International Energy Programme, and we've had a series of workshops um, on, on, on the future of energy and the, f the future of oil um, in, in, in the time of uh, decarbonization. Uh, obviously, in Saudi Arabia, we're well-placed well to observe how resource-rich resource countries in the MENA region uh, can respond to, to the challenges posed by the energy transition. Uh, while we've got very close links with uh, Saudi Aramco, obviously, we, we operate uh, at arm's length, uh, though we can go to them and um, share experiences and... and and see, and they explain their thinking. Uh, but certainly, in the last three years that I've, I've been in the region, I've witnessed um, some pretty dramatic um, changes in terms of the regional mindset. Um, many of you who would have seen countries in the region um, at the IPCC or, or COP um, will have seen that they were in denial. Uh, about climate change and about the energy transition. Clearly, that period is now well and truly over. Uh, political and um, company corporation, NOCs, uh, recognize that um, climate change is underway, and they do recognize that fossil fuels play, play uh, a major role in uh, carbon emissions. Um, they're also obviously very aware that um, the, in the energy is in transition. Um, you know, peak, peak demand is definitely on the horizon. They're watching it very carefully. 
and they're really embarking on mitigation strategies uh, to make sure that they, they survive the energy transition. Uh, initially, when, when they became aware of this, the knee-jerk reaction was to embark on, on mitigation strategies uh, to ensure that a continued um, revenue stream. And th this was done by, by investing down the value chain through the construction of excess uh, and new refining capacity and above all downstream petrochemicals. Um, in the hope that demand for petrochemicals uh, would eventually offset uh, any fall in demand for, for, their own, for their own crude oil. Uh, in a parallel strategy, um, NOCs have been looking at ways to keep their production costs down so that if necessary, uh, they can compete on price. So two levels of competitiveness are immediately apparent. The first is the, the low co cost base of, of many MENA NOCs means that um, they have a very, very low uh, gross break-even, um, typically in the region, um, the production costs around uh, or less than $10 a barrel compared to over $50 in North America. The second um, competitive edge that uh, NOCs have is, is, is the availability of capital. So they can, they can carry on investing even, even when oil prices come down uh, in, in, the, in the expectation that um, oil prices will come up. And um, so beyond the NOC level, um, the energy transition has galvanized governments into looking at a future beyond oil. Um, Saudi Arabia's uh, 2030 National Transformation Plan, for example, um, has set a target of 9.5 gigawatts of uh, renewable energy by 2030. And you'll see that other countries in the region have similar, similar plans. Uh, but in the short term, of course, uh, governments are turning to the NOC to provide a steady or, better, or, or higher st stream of, uh, of revenue to invest in these high-cost um, economic uh, diversification plans. For this, governments are looking to reduce their own growing demand for oil in order to maximize exports. And they're doing this by reducing subsidies and embracing alternative energy sources such as natural gas, nuclear, as in the, as in the UAE, and uh, across the entire region, um, renewable energy. So once again, uh, carbon, obviously the world's most fungible commodity, moves from one region to another. But on a more positive note, it does mean that a reduction in per capita carbon emissions in a region which has the highest carbon intensity Clearly, you know, the worst possible scenario would be for producers to say, well, if we can't export it, then we should use it all at home. Uh, that's, that's not happening. There's also an increasing uh, awareness in the Middle East that um, the region could maintain its, its role as the world's largest energy supplier. Um, not just by uh, exporting crude oil, but actually by, by exporting energy in the form of uh, uh, solar power. Um, and obviously, and, and aware of this potential, countries such as Saudi Arabia are already looking at beefing up their um, power interconnection with neighbors such as, as Egypt and Iraq, uh, both, both countries with large and growing populations. And in the, the Iraqi case, that's obviously, you know, one step closer to Europe. So uh, a large interconnected grid linking Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Turkey eventually, and onto Europe um, is an aspiration uh, in the long term. But it's not all about exporting power. Um, to give you an example of some of the sort of imaginative thinking that one can indulge in um, and that is being indulged in when you have plenty of capital, uh, Saudi Arabia is seriously looking at importing um, hydropower uh, from Ethiopia, which in turn would then free up more oil for export. <laughs> 
I just want to end, end, end with a sort of a, a, um, a new narrative which is appearing um, and one, one that's being promoted by CAPSARC. And that is that um, Middle East countries uh, like, like Norway are, are aware that their, their oil is um, carbon competitive. Um, and there is clearly potential for full decarbonization of, of oil if, uh, if you have um, uh, reservoirs that are suitable for carbon capture and storage. Uh, so increasingly, um, Saudi Aramco is looking at the possibility of, for example, producing hydrogen at the wellhead, um, re-injecting the, um, the carbon into the oil field, and um, then exporting um, um, completely uh, carbon carbon neutral hydrogen, for example, to to Japan, where it could be used as a, in in, um, in 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 vehicle transportation sector. Good. Great. Thanks so much, Bob. Um, I have loads of questions, and so I'm sure all of you do too. So um, I think it would be good. Uh, Let's see kind of how many hands we have. So starting here with Megan, then Iveta, then do others have questions? Okay, we'll start with those two. Uh, I just wanted uh, to ask David to elaborate on the slide about um, too big to fail um, and, and what you mean by that. Um, so I think uh, the stat was um, Equinor represented something like 60% of Norway's um, national debt. Um, so, what what does that mean in practice? Like, what, what would it look like if a company was about to fail and um, and the government had to bail them out in some way? Um, and and do you think Equinor is too big to fail, or, or do the kind of factors that Dominic mentioned um, sort of mitigate against that in terms of it being an international oil company publicly listed and so on? Um, and yeah, any any more comments on that? Well, thank you all for the very interesting uh, presentations. I'm Iveta Girasimchuk from the International Institute for Sustainable Development. I have um, a question about comparative advantage uh, of uh, national oil companies, or more broadly state-owned enterprises, so also coming back on Valerie's points. Because from the economic perspective, of course, uh, like performance of SOEs is very uh, often lower than in the private sector. Uh, but uh, in a wider sense, and especially for the Gulf and developing countries with large young populations, the uh, social contract with those companies is different. And most people work, want to work in the state-owned company because it's how the state is giving back to the people. Uh, and uh, as a result, unfortunately, nobody wants to work in the renewable sector. Uh, so my question is um, how you handle this problem if SOEs are less productive uh, in delivering the renewable energy and transition agenda, and also whether if it's not national oil companies that can diversify this way, there should be renewable energy companies owned by the state. Uh, hi there, thank you. That was a very fascinating panel. Um, a question for uh, for Paul, but uh, also if the rest of the panel want to weigh in, I'd be I'd be curious. Um, I was very struck to hear you say that you think there's been a change of mindset uh, in the Gulf and a, and a seriousness about climate change and about the need for the transition. And I suppose my question would be whether or not you see that more as an elite-driven uh, thing or something that has kind of a popular popular legitimacy aspect to it. Is it is it something coming from above? and in response perhaps to international pressure, or is it something driven from below? Um, we know that um, in Saudi, for example, a lot of the population are very young. So yeah, I guess your, your assessment of that. Thanks. So if we can take that first round and hopefully there'll be some more questions and maybe we also have questions for each other. If not, um, maybe Paul can start and we can just go down the panel with whoever would like to answer any number of the questions either directed to you or otherwise. Uh, yeah, so on the energy transition in Saudi Arabia, I mean, ultimately, the energy transition is not something that's being driven by by the population. I mean, the energy transition is a reality. Um, 
And um, so, so policymakers are really responding to something that, that's going. I mean, in terms of oil, in terms of the international um, energy transition, in that it affects oil and demand for oil, they ca they can't. You know, they're just responding to to a, to a trend. Uh, in terms of uh, restructuring the system, um, the energy system in Saudi Arabia, no, it, it, it is purely policy driven um, fr from the top. Um, consumers, if anything, consumers complain that the prices are rising and um, they're not too happy with that. Um, it's the policymakers who are saying, this is crazy, we can't subsidize energy, we're using too much of it internally, we have a very, you know, we have a, a growing population, um, it's only a question of time uh, before, before domestic demand is, is, is so great that we actually don't have any energy to, um, uh, to export. Uh, famously, a couple of years ago, Chatham House um, published some projections which suggested that Saudi Arabia would be a net, in, net energy importer uh, in the foreseeable future. Um, and uh, I think it, it got a few minds thinking. Um, well, I don't know whether David or I should take this question about Econor's, um, uh, uh, Econor and debt and the, and the, and the, and the National, I, I, I'm interested to hear David's explanation because I suspect that the, the numbers we saw didn't include the, the figures for the Sovereign Wealth Fund, which would make the, the Norwegian uh, not, debt look slightly different once you, once you factor that, that, that in. Um, also, I think it's fair to say that uh, Equinor is a large company in, in Norway, but it's by no means the dom no means, a, 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 you know, a, it, it, Norway is a diversified economy with lots of different sectors, um, and uh, Equinor is one big player, but there are other big players too. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure that Equinor is the right, the right company to illustrate the point you were trying to make, which I think is a good one, actually. Um, can I just pick up the question about no one wants to work in the, the renewable sector? One of the interesting things about being a renewables company and an oil and gas company um, is that you can give a chance for people who whose careers so far have been in the oil and gas industry to work on the new renewable sector. And if you think about it, our, you know, our, our area of speciality so far in renewables has been offshore wind. And that's a deliberate choice because it's building on a, what we think is a competitive advantage. We know how to operate in hostile marine conditions in extreme weather conditions in the, in the North Sea, et cetera, uh, where, where it's very windy um, and, and build large structures. Um, and it is very interesting how popular moving into the renewables business is for people who, who've built careers so far in oil and gas. And I think certainly when we're recruiting graduates in Norway and elsewhere, the fact that we are a diversified energy company now as opposed to just an upstream oil and gas company is definitely an advantage. So I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good sign. It's a good sign. And when we were, you know, I was involved with recruiting young people in East Anglia in the UK, um, a few hundred miles from here, um, for, for work on our on our big UK wind farms, and you know, we had interest at every level, in, and in quite depressed areas of the country as well. Yeah, and the two things fell in the Equinor question. Yeah, for, for Equinor, uh, that's really a a function of of the debt figure I was using. So it's it's gross debt. It's not including uh, lending by the country, and it's certainly not including uh, the sovereign wealth fund of about a trillion dollars. So. Um, if if something awful happened, uh, I, I imagine Ecuador would be okay. Not to, uh, it, it's still a systemically important institution in Norway, but it, it wasn't uh, the one I was really making the point about. Um, and that goes for some of the other countries. Um, but the overall point is is that yes, in many of these these countries, uh, these NOCs are systemically very important institutions in the same way that. Banks were during the financial crisis in the same way that um, other state companies have been important, say, uh, in Zambia uh, for a long time. Uh, the mines there were nationalized um, and a steady downturn in, in copper prices uh, meant that the state was steadily drawn further into supporting this company uh, until, until it literally was the state uh, and bankrupts the whole country. Um, 
Uh, so a lot of what the research will be doing is seeing is has this happened before in oil uh, co companies? Uh, what lessons can we learn from other state companies? Um, and in which cases is this particularly important? So, so in Norway, yes, the, the economy is slightly more diversified. It's still I think, mainly an oil, oil uh, country, but it's in a lot better situation than, than the countries we work in um, that don't have the finances, uh, don't have the, the non-oil private sector to, to, uh, to steady itself against some sort of major shock to its oil company. Um, just to respond to the to that question, uh, Iveta, about uh, NOC performance. Um, I mean, c broadly speaking, I mean, I think we can't speak broadly about NOCs because they're so so varied. Um, but we can generally say that their financial performance on several metrics isn't as good as the private oil companies. But it's important also to see that they're. Um, they're providing value that isn't measured with those financial metrics, uh, like providing energy to d domestic um, citizenry. So at a, at a suboptimal, non-commercial price, they are told to provide energy to this rural community, they do it. So th and that's why it's actually interesting to think about whether NOCs would be good champions for uh, providing energy uh, at, you know, in a transition where it's not profitable initially, or maybe not as, tra as profitable enough to attract international investors yet. Um, and I think one thing that's interesting to me too is the, the idea that NOCs might be sort of like flagship entities, right? So they aren't always, but in many countries, if they are sort of this flagship that attracts the best talent, you know, it's the best employer in the country, it's the, one of the only places doing R&D, um, it can, they have finance, they can often self-finance their projects. So, you know, using those assets to start a, a, an investment in renewables can be an, int an attractive prospect. Um, and just one, one, one point on the transferable skills that you made, I thought that was quite interesting, the windy platforms and the windy farms. Um, uh, that's a really good example of a transferable skill. I do kind of wonder when, when, you talk to, when you talk to people in renewable companies, purely renewable companies, and I mentioned the prospect of national oil companies becoming national energy companies and would that be interesting? Uh, would that be good? And they're horrified. They're saying that uh, their employees would never want to work in, in a reformed oil company that's trying to be an <laughs> a renewable company. Um, but more seriously, they were saying that the a big difference is that uh, an oil and gas project is a very capital intensive one big project, whereas renewables is more akin to manufacturing with lots of little projects, small scale, um, and so it's a different it's a different uh, process of decision making, of capital expenditure allocation, different corporate culture. It's not the cowboy high risk, uh, you know. In the up in, in exploration, it's a ten percent risk of success, uh, a, a chance of success. Pardon in finding a discovery. So. It creates a certain corporate culture and, and in, in the company that is very different from a, a, the renewable sector. So it's not to say there isn't transferability, but I, I think it's something to dig deeper into. Paul, you were going to respond, I think, Yeah, to I think um, NOC is becoming NECs. It's an interesting idea. And within the, the Gulf context, clearly the NOC is the best managed company and the most efficient company historically in that in the country. This is the case of Aramco, it's the case of Adnoc, uh, and to a certain degree KPC and Q8. And there is a tendency as a result for the government, uh, if, they, if they want a new idea, a new implementation, to go straight the NOC because they can say, you can do it. Um, however, I think they're going to find a degree of pushback um, NOCs historically and for legacy reasons are completely locked in to oil. Uh, they produce it efficiently and well and their whole corporate mindset is to produce oil. Um, so there was pushback historically uh, 
uh, in Saudi Arabia not to get involved in renewables, and but the government is determined for it to go ahead, and it is. Uh, in the UAE, again, Adnoc really wasn't interested in picking it up, so Mazdar was created, and Mazdar are doing that job very well. Um, so we might see some NECs um, appearing, but I, I don't, uh, so probably not so much in uh, Saudi Arabia or UAE. Great, I think we have some more questions. Um, so we have, I think, five. So let's just go through them from the front to the back. Sorry, do you mind? Sorry, there's the woman with the microphone. If you don't mind, there's someone actually in the very front row. So if we just go one, like all the way back, just don't want to miss anybody. Hi, Pete Erickson, Stockholm Environment Institute. There's one strategy for um, national oil companies in a low carbon transition that I haven't heard mentioned yet. And that is one that was brought up in this recent paper by <laughs> Jim Crane at Rice University in Houston, um, where essentially the national oil companies, he mentioned Saudi Arabia and OPEC in particular, would band together to essentially allocate shares for production in some declining schedule that would you know benefit both the climate and um, the oil exporters. I'm wondering if that is something you've looked at or is even at all realistic. Thanks. Hi, I'm Nathan Lumfers, a PhD student from the University of Toronto. And I had a question uh, regarding capital flight and a lot of times in companies, at least where I come from in Canada, uh, the government uh, or uh, non-state actors say, okay, we should have this sort of climate policy. Uh, the oil industry comes back, says that's, that'll be a, a competitiveness concern for us. We're emissions intensive trade exposed. Uh, we're going to ha see our oil and gas company leave. There'll be a, a capital strike in that country. It's different for states with a national oil company. And I was just wondering what your opinions are when that risk of Stato or Equinor leaving the Norwegian continental shelf is extremely remote, or Saudi Aramco leaving Saudi Arabia, not going to be happening. How does that impact um, how the oil companies perceive the competitiveness risks from, from national climate policy, or uh, outside of national oil companies within the sort of domestic arena, what sort of climate policies are realistic or risky? Thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed this panel. There's lots and lots of food for thought for, from everybody. Um, and I guess just a couple of comments. One would be um, drawing, drawing on the, the issue of the commercial or economic drivers for um, NOCs going into, uh, you know, becoming more involved in the energy sector. I guess the consideration is, is different for NOCs in the sense that for IOCs, um, their whole business model revolves around this unique high rent industry um, and renewables doesn't replace that, can't possibly generate the kind of economic rent that, that, uh, uh, that, that comes from, from oil uh, in, in the current, you know, in the current business model. Um, wind is probably, uh, you can see that the way that um, in terms of the expertise, it would transfer better to, to wind and, and geothermal than it would solar. Uh, in one example, one uh, uh, so-called gold-plated solar um, project by an NOC, um, uh, I heard that the foundations were built, you know, with heavy concrete and a bit like you'd do for an oil installation, but of course it didn't need that. So it might, you know, the, the solar uh, projects might end up more expensive because the companies are not as nimble and, you know, uh, competitive as the private sector. Um, but the other consideration I just wanted to mention is, um, is, is the potential for NOCs to maybe... Um, diversify into carbon management, develop develop ex excellence in carbon management, given that a lot of them are already, like Saudi Aramco, very interested in CCS, um, experimenting with um, carbon capture and usage as well. And as you pointed out, uh, some some interesting developments with, um, with, with hydrogen. Um, but, you know, perhaps more nationally, they could become 
centers of excellence in in carbon accounting and driving down other other kinds of emissions as well that might be more suited to their expertise sorry, sorry. Yeah. Row of other questions so can you put your hands up just so i know who has a question i think we have three left please keep them to 30 seconds because then we'll just do one round of responses Thanks. Sorry, I should have said that at the beginning. Okay, so very quickly, Neil McCulloch from the Policy Practice. Um, uh, we've heard a little bit about uh, Equinor and uh, a little bit about um, Saudi Aramco. Of course, there are lots of other NOCs all around the world. And in many of those NOCs, they're loss-making or they're at least forced to incur very heavy losses because there's, uh, they've got social obligations to sell petrol for far less than it actually costs to suck up or electricity for far less than in the case of utilities and so forth. The co conversations that I've had with those types of NOCs, generally they hate renewables uh, because they're desperately trying to minimize the extent to which they are forced to, to take on these losses. And if renewables are actually more expensive than uh, sucking up oil, then they would rather not uh, invest in renewables. Is that your experience in your conversations with other NOCs? Thanks so much. Uh, Lucas from the Oxford Sustainable Finance Program. Uh, this question's for Dominic. Um, we've seen Equinor, Statoil, uh, come to this conference or conferences like this several times, and it's, it's really great to see uh, companies being willing to engage, and, and Equinor and Statoil in particular has been so willing to engage on, on this topic. And so my question is, um, given, as, as you say, Equinor is very IOC-like, um, I'm, I'd like to ask you to speculate a little bit, which might be unfair, but um, to speculate a little bit on, on um, why you think other IOCs aren't so willing to engage on this topic. And I have a couple of hypo you know, hypotheses. Is it because the shareholders don't want it? Is it because management doesn't want to? Is it this NOC component that Equinor has? Or is it that there's only room for one sort of re renewable transitioning oil company? Hi, Kia Kuna from Lingo. I have also have a question for Dominic. Um, you said that your strategy is compatible with the Paris Agreement. And um, from my understanding, we are looking at uh, de complete decarbonization by uh, about around 2050. And then uh, obviously Europe has to be earlier than other countries. So it seems like you are uh, still looking at uh, selling gas to Europe uh, after 2030. So you must be creating a space for that in your assumptions by shutting down coal faster. So I was wondering what your assumptions are um, about the collapse of the coal industry. Thanks so much, everyone. Those are great questions. And I know we won't get to all of them, but the whole point of this is to start a conversation that hasn't been happening. So. Um, thank you for all of those. Um, if everyone can just take a couple of minutes, I know we're going over time, so. Maybe everybody take 30 seconds. 30 seconds, <laughs> which is impossible, but yeah, go okay. do that. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll go for yours. Um, I'm not, haven't read the paper, but if the implication is that OPEC should, should get together to have a, an agreed supply cut over time, uh, that's an absolute no-no. Uh, clearly, OPEC is there to supply oil for as long as it's um, there is demand, um, and eventually, uh, yeah, I mean, there will be a free-for-all in which the um, the lowest cost producer will be the last man standing. Um, certainly, I don't, I can't imagine them thinking that, that in that direction for the foreseeable future. Dominic, there were a couple of questions for you. Okay, I did, uh, uh, yes, okay, so Lucas's question about, other, I can't really speak for what other IOCs are thinking. Um, it could simply be that, you know, it's two days out of a working week and, you know, people are really busy and it's, you know, the, 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 there's, there's lots of other events, um, you know. Um, but I was talking about this with, with Michael last night and, you know, I think there are ways in which you can attract people here um, and maybe you just need, to, just need a critical mass. Or maybe you need to, I think you could do it, but I'll, I'll, I'll work with the organizers to see whether we can, we can do better in future. Um, uh, coal. Um, so, I mean, we assume that coal will no longer be part of the European energy mix by, by I'm not sure we'll put a date to it, but certainly well before the middle of the century. Um, 
coal, the German Coal Commission is looking at 2030 something. Um, that seem, doesn't seem very ambitious to me. Um, but our, our products will have to be decarbonized in Europe by the by the middle of the century. And, and, the, and I, my point about hydrogen was showing a way you could do that, which is which is cheaper than alternatives, we think. Um, the real question about coal, though, is Asia. I mean, if you really care about two degrees, it's something. The coal in Asia is the is the real challenge now. I think coal in Europe is is is, is on its last legs. Um, uh, I just wanted to. No, I, I, I won't go because I've done my minute. Um, well, I probably can't even take a minute because I think I can maybe answer the capital flight question. Although I didn't quite understand it, so we should talk afterwards. But um, I guess on one side, uh, the lot of NOCs we're talking about, they're going to suffer the same emerging market financial problems, that there's, there's going to be a lot of hot money coming in and out. Uh, and that's something we, we haven't looked at, but is, is important. Uh, on, on the other side, it's going to be interesting to see uh, how IOCs already work with NOCs, but, but as they say, get shut out of, of high cost uh, markets in their own countries or in New Zealand where, where exploration is banned, how they start to work with NOCs in, in countries where there's lower costs and more opportunities. Um, and that's it. Because otherwise, Michael's going to start pulling okay. us off the table. Okay. Um, I think that uh, the question of uh, oil and gas being a very high, like a high rent uh, industry versus the renewables just, you know, turning a profit and not having that uh, that extra amount of money that comes not from the productive use of capital, but the fact that it's it's a commodity. Uh, I think that that requires a big change of mindset uh, in that transition to just making a profit, but it also requires a huge focus on cost control. Uh, so to be successful in that, the NOCs would really have to be changing their processes and their decision-making profits. And where it's not profitable, I mean, of course, there would be pushback by the NOC and they would drag their feet and it would be a failure. But presumably, we'd, they'd have to find a portfolio of investments that are also profitable so that it can be viable long-term. Great, thank you so much. If we can just give a hand to the whole panel.